So everybody's in here has had DC, right? Everybody had anybody had AC yet? Oh, huh? I, So this is what we'll look at. Look a bit about, a little bit about electrical, electronic, mechanical, fluid power, and program of our controllers. Now we're going to start in other labs here. Uh, uh, along. In fact, uh, one of the other labs that we're going to do today is we're going to let y'all take the line apart. And then we'll put it back together and make sure it, it's aligned up properly. But electrical, we have uh, two types of power sources. You know, electricity, we have what we call DC and AC. Anybody know the difference between those? What's DC stand for? And what does that mean? Uh, it means it flow, the current flows in one direction, right? Uh, flows from negative to positive. So in DC we have voltage. Everybody know what voltage is? What's voltage? How would you define voltage? So y'all went through DC and y'all didn't learn how to define voltage. Yeah, it's, well, it's, that's what it is. It's, technically, we call it it's the difference of electrical potential, but basically it's just the pressure. That causes something called current flow, right? And where's current? I need to put that up here. What's current? Flow of electrons, right? And then what's resistance? It's opposition to the current flow. And then what's power? It's work. Well, it's actually the rate of doing work. So you can't, you can't do work without moving things, right? Does that make sense? In fact, the, the, the formula for power is, for power is force divided by distance or it's force times speed because distance and speed are inversely proportional, right? Does that make sense? So to get work, number one, you got to have some force and then you got to have motion. Everybody understand that. Of course, the formula we use for power is uh, the force times speed. <laughs> and of course, so our force, uh, I can't get to my markers without pausing. So I need to add current in here. So uh, we use power, you, we use force, which is our voltage, right? E or V times what? And what is I? Yeah, but this is the speed. So this is our force. And then I is our speed. Because that's what current is. What is it? How much is one amp? It's strange how you remember things. 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons moving past a point in one second. So that's definitely speed, right? So we take our voltage, which which is a pressure, but you got to have one. As soon as you take a pressure and push it against something, you generate force. Everybody understand that? And so this is the way we calculate power, which is the rate of Got to have resistance. Can't have power without resistance, right? You understand that? So we end up with two other power formulas. What's our other two power formulas? <laughs> What's that? I square R. And what's our third one? B square over R. You know, understand where those came from. <coughs> huh? 
came through Ohm's law. Yeah, all we did was come back and substitute what Ohm says V is equal to or E is equal to, and then we combine those functions. Uh, now in AC, <coughs> we have uh, we also have current. <coughs> And we have resistance, <coughs> but we picked up something else in AC that we don't have in DC. It's called reactance. Anybody know what reactance is? What we get, what we get in AC that we don't get in DC is AC is generated, AC power is generated on a waveform that we refer to as a sine wave. So if I was to get my oscilloscope out and look at an AC waveform, it would look like this. And then it would just keep going on and on and on and on until we have a big snowstorm and it knocks our power out, right? And this is supposed to be repetitive. And this is the waveform is technically referred to as a sine wave. We spell it with one word, but just about every spe spell check will tell you that that's wrong. They want you to say sine wave. And uh, why we uh, why we get that is this it, uh, AC is generated on a circle. So I wish I had that animation. Uh, I don't have it in this class, but I got it in another class. This is the way AC is generated. It's generated on the surface. Say that? Very neat. So basically, e, and here's here's the sine wave being generated. This is cro this crosses zero. This crosses zero. And this crosses zero. Well, notice when it crosses zero the second time, it's always right there. So we say a sine wave has uh, how many degrees on the surface? 360, so we say one sine wave has 360 electrical degrees. One wave, one repetition of the waveform. Each repetition, each repetition of the waveform we refer to as a cycle. So that's what it's doing. It's constantly doing what? Constantly cycling. Well, what happens if I come over here and stop this anywhere? So if I come over here and stop this anywhere, if I can stop it, Oh, here, I got it. If I can stop that anywhere. And what we'd look is, dang it, Rick. That's the question. So it stopped. What we look at, I don't know if you noticed, but it started up, but this guy right here, this guy moving around is always equal to the radius of the circle. Y'all notice that? And if I come up here and stop it, I know my my, my touch screen is enabled. If I come up here and stop it, and then I drop down a, uh, if I drop down a vertical from here to here, I perform what we refer to as a right triangle. And this this length now, even though this right here is the radius, this length right here represents that actual amplitude of it. Now I know the length of this, so that would be equal to this voltage right there. So if I was looking at this waveform, let's say that's 170 volts, then what would it be? What would it be right here? Well, I know that this right here would be equal to 170, right? The length of that. And then I can use this, this word, and this is what we call it, it, it always forms a right triangle. What's neat about a right triangle is to maintain, and, and 
so anybody know the, what, what's the sums of all the angles in a triangle? Always equals 180 degrees. So that means if one of them's 90, the other two, the other two, the sum of the other two has to be what? 90. So that means if I know any of these angles, the other two angles, then I can calculate the length of the other side. And we call that trig. When we deal with this guy, so I'm dealing with this one, this would be what we call the angle of theta. I can calculate this by taking the sine of that angle. And then I can multiply it by this guy, which is the hypotenuse, and that will give me the length of that side of it. So what we're saying is if I take the sine, the sine, so what, so this is why this guy got the name of a what? A sine wave. So the instantaneous value of the sine wave varies with the angle, you know. And that's how I got the name sine wave. Uh, the problem we have with AC is it causes strange things to happen in a circuit. So anybody that tells you AC and DC is the same thing don't have a slightest idea what's going on. What happens is we have devices in AC uh, that we call inductors. And we have capacitors. Now the symbol, the electrical symbol of inductor is this guy right here. And the electrical symbol of a capacitor is this guy right here. Now what these things, these things are real strange. They, current, uh, AC current does not flow through them. Current flows in and out of them, which is real weird. And since current flows through them, they don't generate any power. So these guys don't get hot. But they have a function in life. They have a function in life, right? You understand. Uh, but the problem we have, so what happens with our, uh, uh, what, what this causes to happen is that Predominantly, so any coil of wire is an inductor. How many coils of wire do you think Alabama Power sees when it's transmitting? Every transformer is nothing but a coil of wire. All your motors are nothing but a coil of wire. Anytime we throw inductors into the process, what inductors do, the main circuit, the main power grid is, is, is parallel. Now what advantage does parallel have over serial? We can, we can do what? We can add loads and we can do what? Remove loads without any problem. So the power grid's parallel. Well, parallel voltage is constant. So that means what happens is that your current in an, your current in an inductive circuit literally lags behind the voltage. We're not going to talk about why. You'll learn that if you take AC. But the current, it literally lags behind the voltage, which means the power in, so, you're not getting maximum power when your voltage is maximum like you get in DC. And it's a really weird stuff. Uh, this split, what this happens, when this happens, it causes us to get a, a type of power in our circuit that we call a parent power. Now, what's real neat is capacitors and inductors cancel each other out. So uh, what we do is once we get a phase shift, we create what well, it creates something we refer to as a parent power. And this is so if I went out to a company and I measured the voltage in the current in a phase, and I multiplied those together, I would get what we call a parent power. But these devices right here are doing what? Now they have a job, but they do no work. Y'all understand that? So current flows in and out of them. Uh, the analogy we use is buckets. So I could come over here and I could have two buckets, right? You understand that? And then I could come over here and have a load, and then I could have a pump. Well, this guy, current is flowing through that resistor, so it's what? It's doing work, but there's no current flow between the what? Between the buckets. So to get work, current's got to flow through the device, right? You understand? So what we end up with is we end up with two types of power in an AC circuit. 
uh, we end up what we call a parent power. And then we end up with what? True power or real power? I think I misspelled a parent. Some people call it real power, some people call it true power. And we have a formula where we get, they, they have what we call the power factor, uh, where you take the real power and you divide it by the parent power, and this tells you how much work you're getting. So this is the problem we have with with uh, inductors and capacitors. We need this phase shift. Uh, one thing we need to do is uh, one one place we use the phase shift is in single phase motors. Single phase motors, if you just put single phase on them, that motor would just sit there and hum at you. So to get a motor to move, one of your magnetic fields has got to do what? It's got to shift, right? You understand that? So this is why when you look at single phase motors at your house, odds are they're going to have a capacitor on And we call it a start capacitor. What's the function of those things? Is to create a phase shift so the, so that single phase motor will do what? Will start. Uh, now normally we kick that start winding out because once something's in motion, it creates its own phase shift, right? Does that make sense? So, uh, but we do have uh, we do have different motors. We have what they call a capacitive run motor, and you'll look at those. They'll have two capacitors on them, or they'll have one capacitor that's got three leads on it. Uh, those motors uh, create they create more run horsepower at a, using a smaller size. So you all figure out so that's basically how they got the name what sine wave. And so we end up with true power and apparent power in AC circuit that we don't end up in, we don't have true power. By the way, uh, the opposition in an AC circuit, now the, the, the definition of the impedance is a circuit that can't contain both resistors and reactive devices. So what you're going to find out in AC, just about everybody calls the opposition in an AC circuit, they call it impedance. Have you ever heard that term before? Can't say that anymore. A conductor? What's a conductor? What's the function of a conductor? From the to the load. So every circuit's got to have a load, right? These guys have almost no opposition. They do have opposition. Uh, very little, but when you start, we say very little, it's very little for a, for a short distance, right? Uh, what determines the resistance of a, of a metal conductor? Anybody know? Length, right? And that's the one that gets us right there. What's the next one? What's the next one? Let's say size next. And then what's the fourth? So we can't say it's got very little, you know. So if I've got a 20 gauge wire, you know, 20 gauge wire, and I got three inches, I won't be able to measure that resistance. But if I was to stretch that out a mile, right, you understand, uh, that wire would have a lot. That conductor would have a lot of resistance. So, uh, uh, Wire gauges are, wire, are, are rated at, uh, over in the U.S. we rate, we rate ohms per thousand feet. You ever look at the American wire gauge? And that's going to be at a certain temperature, right? You understand that? Well, what, the function of the conductor, it has, we have two, two types of conductors. So we have power conductors and we have signal conductors. You all know, understand the difference? We okay? Y'all understand the difference between a signal and power? You know, 
Do y'all know the difference between a signal and power? So when I go out there on my car, my car's got an antenna hooked up to it, and there's a wire running from that antenna down to the back of my radio. What type, what, what information does that wire carry? It don't carry power, it carries a lot of signal. Okay. But my radio will not work without what? Power. So, uh, metal conductors, we can get those to can, and, and we see that over there. So we, we have power conductors and we have signal conductors, right? You understand? Usually signals are high impedance or high resistance circuits and, and power circuits are low resistance, low resistance circuits, right? You understand that? And then we have fiber optics. We have fiber optics on both our lines over there. Fiber optics only carry signals. They don't carry power in the form of light, right? So what's the best conductor of electricity? What's the best metal conductor of electricity? Well, everybody wants to say, I heard that. Silver. Silver. Uh, what's the second base conductor of electricity? Copper. What's the third best conductor of electricity? Copper. Huh? Yeah, copper, copper alloy. Uh, what's, but this is a, this is not actually, a, this is an alloy, right? What's an alloy? Uh, What's an alloy? <laughs> it's, I don't know what an alloy is. An alloy is a metal that's made of two or more metals. So when I start combining metals, then we end up with what? Alloy. Uh, so we'll leave uh, that third best, uh, copper alloy, this is, and then we have gold. Uh, the normal tendency for a lot of people to think gold's the best conductor of electricity, but it's not. Uh, what advantage does gold have over copper and aluminum? Huh? It doesn't rust. It doesn't rust. Yeah. So anything, uh, not anything, a lot of things that is going to be exposed to the atmosphere, a lot of things that's going to be exposed to the atmosphere will use a good conductor like copper and then will plate it with gold. And the plating is what you see, right? You don't see the copper. And it's a very, 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 very thin coating of, of, uh, of uh, gold. Copper oxide is a, a good insulator, by the way. Everybody understand the difference between stranded and solid strand wire conductor? So what do you mean by solid and stranded? Maybe I'll make a break now. Yeah, a solid is a single wire, right, or single conductor. A stranded conductor, it consists of multiple strands or multiple. What advantage does stranded conductors have over solid conductors? Yeah, they're more flexible, right? What advantage does solid conductors have over metal, con I mean, stranded conductors? So I get into my house wire and I look look at how those plugs are put on there. How do they put those wires on there? On a, on a plug. They just twist them around, right? No, they ain't stranded. They're solid. Huh? Yeah, solid. They're easy. The advantage of solid over stranded is they're, it, first of all, they're cheaper because strands are harder to make. But the big advantage is they're easier to terminate and splice. So when I get a solid conductor, if I want to splice them, what do we use? What do they do with in your house? They just do what? They just twist them together, right? You understand? Put a wire nut on top of it. Uh, when they want to terminate, uh, what's termination? Eventually, a conductor is going to come to an end. Everybody understand that? The function of the conductor is what? Get it from the source to the load, right? Eventually, they got to come to an end. The act of bringing your conductor to an end we refer to as termination. But there is no such thing as a conductor that's an infinite length. 
in conductors break. So the act of connecting two conductors together, we refer to that as what? A splice. Uh, drainage conductors, you have to put, you either put, you either put terminals on them, crimp terminals, solar terminals, or you put them in a compression where they can't, uh, bird, we call it bird caging when the strands split out. Because if you got a screw and one of the strands comes out, you change the gauge of the conductor, right? You understand that? Control devices, push button, push button, push button, contact, and seal key. By loads, they can be resistive, they can be capacitive, they can be inductive. So, capacitive, these are those guys we call capacitors, and inductors are those loops of wire, right? You understand? Indicators, motors, solenoids, relays. Don't understand relay. Everybody okay with a relay? What's a relay? What's the relay? It's a what? Yes, yeah, an electrically controlled switch. So uh, over here, when I turn these lights off and on, I go over there and do what? Get a switch. A relay. We use magnetics to electrically control. Uh, what's nice about a relay is a relay can have one or more what we call contacts on it. So we can get relays that have a lot of contacts or relays that have one, right? The number of contacts a relay has, by the way, is called a pole. So if it says it's a five pole relay, you know there's what? Five contacts inside. Motor starters, we'll go over and look at some of these relays and then DC circuit. So this seems like a pretty good place to take a break. Y'all ready? So y'all, okay on Ohm's Law, Watt's Law, Kirchhoff's Law, series circuit, parallel circuit, series parallel circuit. Y'all okay on both, right? Y'all learned all that in DC? Are you okay? Uh, electronic devices, we have diodes. Anybody know what a diode is? A diode is our check valve in electricity. We only allow current to flow in one direction. Now, this is used primarily to do what? Uh, transistors. Uh, we have bipolar transistors and we have fill effect transistors. Uh, these are our current valves. Y'all know what a water valve does. What do we do with a water valve? What does a water valve do? <coughs> Controls the flow of water. Uh, we can we can use them as switches. We can turn the water off or on, or some of them we can use them as analog, which means we can actually vary. Right? A lot of your water fountains, ice makers, and stuff like that, they either turn them suckers on or they will turn them off. So we have the ability to operate these things in different uh, regions. We can operate them as switches. So uh, that's what you're seeing when the PLC turns on an output or turns off an output, it's using a, uh, some type of solid state device as a watt, as a switch. Uh, then of course we can control the, the, the intensity of lights and all kind of stuff, right? stereos and uh, that, uh, you know, those are going to be analog devices. So uh, a bipolar transistor uses a small, so a bi bipolar transistor has two leads, or three leads, excuse me. Uh, and we have two symbols, and we'll just look at that just a hair. Uh, and it depends on how you uh, buy some. So this is the symbol, two symbols we have. And you can see it's got an arrowhead on it, so we call this a not pointing in or NPN. And this right here we call it a PNP. It depends on how you set them up. Uh, this lead over here, uh, this is called the base. We use that to control. That's the that's the control of the valve. That's the way we electronics we control. Uh, the one with the arrowhead is called the emitter, and then the other guy is called the collector. And what we do is that's the valve right there. So here's the valve. This is the main valve right here. It's between this guy right here. That's the valve. But we control the size of the valve with a with a lead that we call the base. 
which is this government. The two types of, uh, we'll look at, so normally when we have DC sensors, when we have DC sensors, we're going to have EPN sensors and PNP sensors. So what we need to know in this class is what's the difference between an EPN sensor and a PNP sensor. And we'll learn that when we get there. Uh, the other type of transistor we have is what's called a field effect transistor. This is a small gate motion to control a proportion of large drain or source current. And guys, we got we got all types of symbols for this thing. Uh, so we got this guy and then this guy, and then we got uh, this guy. And we got this guy. It's supposed to be an airhead right there. Then we got this guy. So these are called JFEDs. These are called D-MOSFETs, and these are called E-MOSFETs. So we taught it's safe to learn about these guys, but the big thing about these guys is they use the water. Okay, so these guys have extremely high input impedance or resistance. They have really, really high. And if they're running into the right side of the load, we can switch them real fast. But the big disadvantage of them is they can't handle a, they can't handle a lot of power compared to uh, bipolar transistors, and they can't block a lot of voltage. So what they've done is they came out with a combination of the two. This is a combination of a MOSFET and a DJ. So what they do is they bring the input in on a MOSFET and they couple that into a BJT. These are these are going to be used a lot in variable speed AC drives. And then we got integrated circuits. What are integrated circuits? We'll be taking an entire electronic circuit. So, it, so uh, insulated gate BJTs. These are basically ICs because they combine two things. They combine a watt, an an FET with a watt, with a bipolar transistor, and it's insulated. So all I see is I see a I see a device that's got two, three leads coming out of it. And that's that's what an insulated gate. Bipolar junction transistors. So transistors, what are transistors? These are our current valves, right? You understand that? We can make them act like a switch. Where do y'all run into those? At? Computers are digital. Sensors are digital, right? You understand? That? We can use these to either turn these things. And what's nice about these switches is there are no moving parts. So relays are great. They can handle a bunch of power. They can handle a bunch of current, but they're electromechanical devices. Your car is an electromechanical device. Electrical, elect, as soon as I say electromechanical, that means two things can fail. It can, they can fail what? Electrically, or they can fail mechanically. Like Milton's today. Who thought was it, Milton? You know, don't don't say it. That's weird. I'm recording it, right? <laughs> so, so transistors have no moving parts. So that means uh, they can only fail what? Electrically, they can't fail mechanically. So, how much this y'all need to know? Basically, just a little bit. Transistors, they're current valves, right? We control them electrically. Right. Uh, power supplies. We have two categories of power supplies. We have what we call a linear power 
So when we use the term power supply, what are we usually talking about? 99.9% .9 of the time. So what advantage does AC have over, what's the major advantage AC has over DC? Anybody know? Nobody knows. Why, why, why the transformer? What, what advantage is the transformer? What's, what's Alabama Power selling you, or what's TVA selling you? What do they sell you? They sell you power. Well, they've got to get that power from, from, from their, they've got to get that power from the tran, from the power station to your house. Huh? Well, that's what that people don't understand is we have this magic formula where power is equal to what? V times I. Well, what we got, we got this I is equal to what? P over V. That's the guy right there. So I'm trying to give you power. So technically, if I turn on a 100 watt light bulb at my house, the power company has to provide me how many watts? 100 watts. But they don't have to do it at the voltage that I want it at, right? Y'all understand. What can they do with that voltage? Well, if they can step that voltage up, what happens to the current? It goes down, right? You understand that? The lower that I can make that current, the less loss I will have in my conductors because every conductor has a watt. V is equal to I times watt. R. Every conductor has a watt, an R. The lower I can make that current, the less loss I have in my conductor. Uh, people in, uh, in line crews call it, they call it line loss. How much line loss do you have? Right? You understand? So if I can come up here and I can make my voltage, if I can make my voltage like 750,000 volts, then I can send 750,000 kilowatts of hour power with one amp. But what's the wrong, what's the problem with 750,000 volts? Looking for ground. <laughs> right? Looking for ground. Right? You understand that? So where are these high power to high tension lines at? These high voltage lines. They're way up, right? And spread apart. Now when I start getting that thing closer to ground, what do I have to start doing? Stepping the voltage down. Right? You understand? That? So we can get it closer to ground. Right? You understand that? And still make it safer, right? So the further we step it down, the current's going up in 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 the from the source, right? You understand that? The current goes up, right? You understand? Our conductors have to get bigger, but now we're making it what? Starts with S. Safer. So we use AC for transmitting. And also AC motors. AC motors, uh, we can use what we call induction motors. They're really neat. But the big thing that we need to do is elect, what's the advantage? If AC's got all these neat things. What's the advantage of, of DC? Huh? Well, my, I mean, that, a battery generates DC, but that's not the advantage of DC. I've got a lot of things that runs off. What runs off DC at your house? What actually operates off of DC at your house? Your TVs, your computers, your everything, right, operates off DC. The biggest advantage of DC is we can do this right here. We can electronically control it. Electronically control. Right? So DC can be electronically controlled. In fact, we can take DC and convert it back into AC if we want to. But when I convert it back into AC, I can make it whatever frequency I want, right? You understand? So that means this computer operates off DC. That manufacturing line operates off of DC. Uh, your TV operates off of DC. Your microwave operates off of DC. All these devices operate off of DC, but Alabama Power generates AC. So I gotta have some device that does what? Takes DC, AC and converts it to DC. And this is when people says power supply, that's normally 99% of the time what they're talking about. They're talking about that device that
that takes AC and converts it into Y, BC. So the two categories of power supply we have, we have linear power supplies and we have this one. And this is the block diagram of the linear power supply. A linear power supply, the first thing we see is a lot transformer. What does the transformer do? Set the voltage that the power supply is supposed to deliver, right? Then we have to take it and uh, once we once we run it to through rectifiers, we get this garbage right here. We call that pulsating DC. So what do we gotta do next? Gotta filter it out, turn it into unregulated DC. Unregulated DC means it varies with load. So the output when you load it down, the voltage would drop down when you okay. And then we run it to what? Regulated sets the output. Switching power supply, this guy right here is easy to design, it's easy to fix, uh, but it's very inefficient. So what they said is, said, and we're not going to get into the reason why, the higher I can make the frequency, the more efficient the transformers become, which means the transformers can get smaller, the filters get smaller, everything gets smaller if the frequency of the AC we're converting goes up, right? You understand that? So what we do with switching power supply, the first thing they do is what? Then they chop it up using something called pulse width modulation at a very high frequency. Then they run it to a what? Transformer. But if you ever looked inside a switching power supply, this transformer is a little old tiny thing. Why? Because it's a lot high frequency is more what? Efficient for transformers. They can have very they can have a lot fewer turns. Then we run it into a what? Rectifier circuit. Then we sense the output in which you use to control the pulse of power supply. So switching power supplies are a lot more efficient, but they're basically impossible to fix. So if they're designed and, and so normally if a if one of these guys go bad, what do we do? We fix it. We don't take a permanent marker and write bad on our trainers. <laughs> so all these trainers that you use, why well, did that? Because we had an instructor do that. Like that it could never be what? Fixed, yeah. So now we got one that's got a big permanent marker on it since bad. They might have a tape over the bad. But yeah, we can fix these things. They're real easy to troubleshoot. Well, comparatively, once you learn how they operate, there is Relatively easy to troubleshoot. These guys right here, what do they do with these guys? They sell them up, right? And when these guys go out, you usually, you usually just do what? Replace them. These guys generate a ton of, uh, if you didn't do all this filtering and stuff, it's, these guys generate a, a ton of uh, electrical noise too. These cause phase shifts too. So, what are those power supplies over there? I don't know. Uh, usually, a linear power supply is going to be a lot bigger. Uh, this guy right here is rated at uh, 3 point three and a quarter amps. If this is a linear power supply, it'd probably be about this big. Because linear power supplies, everything's got to be bigger because of the 60 cycles. And we're stuck with 60 cycles, right? Because that's where the whole power grid is designed around 60 cycles. Uh, this is the basic makeup of a control system. And this is for all control systems. So we have what? Inputs, then we have what? Control, and then we generate what? Output. Your inputs are going to be switches, contacts, sensors. Uh, your logic is going to, your control is going to be relay logic, which you'll learn about if you take motor control. Uh, could be PLC logic, could be proportional, and there's a little Differentiators, we'll talk about the little derivatives, I'm sorry. Computer microcontrollers and special. And we'll try to look at some of these. We uh, PLCs, you'll probably have classes in PLCs. This class we'll look at PIDs. Anybody ever heard of PIDs before? We'll talk about those. <laughs> microcontrollers, we have some little uh, Arduinos. Have you ever heard of Arduino microcontrollers? Y'all won't program them, but we'll let y'all see some problems. 
Uh, these are switches and push buttons. Don't understand what these guys are for. We we see very few toggle switches in English. We see a lot of push buttons. And more and more we're moving to uh, HMI, human machine interface panels, and we don't even almost have that many physical push buttons anymore. Uh, they're all simulated push buttons. Uh, so these are all input devices, right? So these are what we call on first. These are control devices. Uh, on a PLC, these are the devices that's going to be hooked up to your input ports on your PLC. Uh, on a motor control circuit, these are going to be devices that's in between the, the load, right? Uh, in uh, motor controls, the, the diagrams are very, very simple. Is we have, we know to get current flow, we have to have two two conductors. Well, what we do in motor controls is we have two the two. Uh, some people call them power rails. And on the diagrams, what they do is they run them on ver as vertical lines on both sides. And then what we do, and this is generically called L1 and L2, it's going to change. I've never seen L1 and L2 not in the doc in the in the explanation somewhere, but they'll give it different names. And then what we do is we'll come up here and we'll connect circuits or draw circuits in between L1 and L2. And then we'll use symbols. Okay, you understand. And then the only circuits that we have, if we have basic circuits, which contains one button, and then we have parallel circuits. So I could come up here and do something like this, and this would be legal. Everybody understand that? So there are no true series circuits in motor controls. They're either single element circuits or single load basic circuits or they're parallel circuits. And we use symbols. So these are symbols for push buttons. This would be these guys right here. Now normally these push buttons, notice they've got a protection ring around them. So that means you got to literally do what? Push them. And they're pretty good size. They're really big. And what advantage is that? Well, a lot of people go to work and they wear gloves and all kind of stuff. And what can they do with these? They can press them without doing what? Taking their gloves off, yeah. Uh, then we have some switches called collector switches. We're running through every once in a while. These have nice big knobs on them that we see very few actual toggle switches, switches that do want to go up and down. These are going to be your control devices. So this is the way these work. All your control devices go here. Huh? Yeah, circuit. Uh, the, the the way you connect inputs has nothing to do with a circuit. Is I'm sorry, not input. Inputs is the name we talk about on on the mo on the on the PLCs. These are called control devices. Control devices. Uh, the way you connect control devices have no, has nothing to do with whether it's a, a series circuit or a parallel circuit. It's how you connect the loads. So the only load, the only circuits we have, and this is also true on, on PLCs, the only circuits we have is either parallel or basic circuit, which would be what? One load circuit, right? So yeah, I could come in and I could, you know, I could come in and do this. I could have contacts like this. I could come in here and I could have contacts like this or control devices like this. And then I could come over and have a line, have a light out there. And that still would be just a basic circuit. So and that's also true no matter where you at. Uh, the connection of control devices has nothing to do with whether the circuit series parallel or, se or series parallel or series parallel. That's how you connect the watt in the circuit. How you connect the load. So in motor controls, you got to learn all these symbols. Uh, 
uh, PLCs, we have very few symbols uh, inside the PLC. But are we okay? So PLCs, we call these inputs because they don't actually, we logically form the circuit. Uh, one of the main ways we program a PLC is in what they call ladder. And what it does, it allows us to take this and convert it over to a PLC program really fast. I don't know what language they use at Brother. Okay. Huh? For their PLC. I don't guess they let you play around with those very much. Right. Yeah, when they program them. We have three methods depending on what trade you came up through. Sensors. What is the function of a sensor? Some of y'all already know that. What's the function of a sensor? So what's the function of my sensors? How many sensors does a human have? Got a lot more than that. <laughs> That's the ones we learned. And what are our five basic senses? Okay, so what does my sensor do? What does my brain process? Does my brain no touch? Is it no smell? Is it no sight? What does it process? What type of electrical information? So what do my sensors do? My sensors take some type of physical stimulus, right, and converts it over to water. electrical so my brain can talk. So what do the sensors do? They take a physical stimulus and converts it over to electrical signal that our computer can process or some relay logic can process, right, on sensor. So these are the things we can sense. We can sense presence. So we have presence sensors, also called proximity. Distance, we can sense position, pressure, flow, light, sound, temperature, speed, weight, and they can just, you know, I mean, we can just about design an electrical sensor to sense just about anything that you sense. Right? Because that's all the sensors do. They take what? A physical stimulus and convert it over to an electrical signal so it can be possible. Questions? So we have two broad categories of sensors. We have visual sensors and analog sensors. What's the difference? Yeah, so that technically an analog sensor will give you a, a, a an output that's proportional to what it is measuring. So if you got a thermostat in your house, that sensor is a analog sensor because it don't it don't jump from 90 degrees to 100 degrees. It just goes from the right. So that's an analog sensor you have in your thermostat in your house. A digital sensor is either what on or off. That makes sense. So the predominant sensors that you're going to run into in industry are going to be digital sensors. Uh, these are going to be limit switches. Even though limit switches are a proximity sensor, limit switches have been around so long, they have the honor of being having their own name. They have their own category. Uh, then we have what, so when you hear proximity sensors, when you hear the term proximity sensor, they're talking about our non-contact solid state sensors. So photoelectric, what do you think you've got here? Right. Uh, we have through the beam, we have optical interrupters, we have left over flexion. I think I showed y'all those the other day, right? Uh, then we have inductors. We talk about those. What are those guys say? Uh, system average. And then we have capacitive. What do they say? A lot. <laughs> uh, then we have what we call magnetic sensors. Uh, 
these are magnetic sensors, uh, lead switches, and uh, I have to find my hall tag. I'll have to find this. And then we have a sonic sensor, which basically is one of our genesis sensors. Other non contact sensors, polar. I don't know if that would be categorized as a non contact sensor or not. I don't know how you would sense polars without making contact. But Speed. Well, these might not be non-contact sensors either. I might need to take that out. And just put one. Because it's hard to sense speed. We can sense speed without making contact. Uh, the speed sensors that we have on our line over there, these are non-contact sensors. But then we have these, uh, these TAC generators. These have to make contact with what they're sensing. Variable, variable reluctance has to make contact. The incremental encoders, the coders don't make physical The actual sensing element does not make physical contact. Uh, position, uh, we can use things called uh, potentiometers. Y'all played around with potentiometers a little bit in DC, right? On LVDC, these are linear both with different transformers. The uh, the Amtro line has an incremental encoder on it. The robots simulate an absolute encoder. We'll talk about these. They don't. They're not actually absolute encoders, but they simulate them. Okay, so I need to take that sensor. Those are not necessarily non con Sense and flow, it's almost impossible to sense flow without getting into the flow, right? It's just like your ammeter. Your ammeter, to, to measure current, it's got to get into the flow of the current, right? So this is why an ammeter, uh, we have to break the circuit and literally put the ammeter in series. So analog sensors, temperature sensors, some force sensors, some position sensors, these are going to be uh, analog sensors. Now the problem is, is that when we bring them into a PLC, a PLC is not, a, a PLC is a computer. Which means what? We've got to have some conversion process that takes us from what? Analog over to digital. We call these ADCs. What do you think that stands for? And often we got to go the other way. I've got to generate an analog. If my PLC is going to generate or control an analog device, uh, then we got to have a lot. I'm not going to a DAC. What's a DAC? Here's an analog. Uh, some of your PLCs come, uh, the, the 314s, the, the Siemens we got, comes with both of them. The little 1200s we have are really neat in that they got a, uh, they've got a little snap thing that you can snap it in. So we got A to D on that, on those. That thing has a, it has analog, uh, has analog input. So what we do on that one is add analog output. The 1100, uh, Allen Bradley's we have has analog in, but they don't have analog out. The the uh, three fourteens, the one that's on the uh, on the Amtro line, that has both analog in and analog out it's on the PLC. So digital, this would be an encoder, by the way. It's got a bunch of knobs. It's got a, uh, we call this an optical interrupter. We have one of these on one of our boxes. Open down the lab. This thing spins, it's got all 70 
great brightness out and the, series, the frequency of the pulses would indicate what the speed. So pitchometers, what is a pitchometer? What's the function of a pitchometer? So we got a rheostat and we got a thing called a pitchometer. What's the difference? Yeah, what a what a potentiometer does it, it's a it's a what we call a variable voltage divider. So what I can do with a potentiometer is if I come up here and put ten volts right there, and then this is zero volts, then I come over here or common, and then what if I do if I put my voltmeter across this wiper right here, we call it a wiper. Then if I move it all the way to the top, I get 10 volts. If I move it all the way to the bottom, I get zero volts. If I put it somewhere in the center, I get what? A voltage between what? Zero and 10 volts. So it's literally a variable voltage divider. A rheostat is basically a variable resistor. It, it's in there to, to control the current, right? You understand me? So a variable, a, 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 a potential primarily as a voltage divider, a real static is used primarily as a, a control of the current. And what's nice, you don't see many rheostats anymore because we can take a potentiometer and do this and make it act just like a wall. Yeah, it acts just like a rheostat. So you see that done a lot. But well, we don't see very many rheostats anymore. It's just easier to do that. So if I could take that wiper and connect it to something that Motion. What they're doing is the voltage I get out would represent the actual position. Right? Uh, LVT and LVDT, uh, this guy is weird, right? It's got two lines, and they're round out of phase. What we do is we come over here and we shift this rod inside and get an output signal. And depending on where it's at, it would give you a, an output signal. But if you went the other way, what would happen is the phase would shift. So, depending on the phase, that would tell us the direction. And depending on the amplitude, that would tell us the position within that direction. Does that make sense? So, if I had it right in the center, this guy would give me a zero volt output. But if I started moving like to the right, it'll start getting a, a sine wave out, but it might be negative followed by positive. If I went the other way, it would be what? Positive followed by negative. These are called L L -E linear variable differential transformer. And what we're trying to detect, detect the position of would be attached to that. So these guys attach the position of the and what's the difference be between p position and proximity? Yeah. Or sort of, uh, proximity is at a spot, so when it's at a spot, we detect it. Position would mean when it's over a range, right? Understand? Does that make sense? So this is a pot. This is a real uh, animate. It's kind of junky. But what happens is that we have the actual pot connected to whatever it is we want to keep in position. Whatever it is comes up here. It moves the wiper on the pot. And then we, we, we use that voltage to do what? To determine its position. So if we had 10 volts and I can move it 6 inches maximum, I could take 6, six divided by 10, and that would, get, I'm sorry, I'd take 10 and divide it by 6, and that would give me what we call our volts per inch or whatever. Does that make sense? Now over here we have two of them. Now these are optical encoders. We have two types of optical encoders. Got an 
Yeah, so what would happen on this one if we started out with, uh, with zero? This would give us a binary count. We don't teach binary, but this would be a, a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got to go back up here. Eight, nine. 10, oops, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then after that would be uh, luck, right, I'm saying, because I've just get, hit the range of my absolute total. Uh, what's nice about this, though, is that this guy is going to actually give me a count, so if I'm at that position, I would know exactly where it's at, right? That makes sense. Another nice thing about this, if I was to turn power off and not move my device, if I came back up and put power back on it, I would know my, my, my control system would know where that device was at from the start. That makes sense. But the problem is, is you're limited by the number of tracks. So this gives me 16 combinations, and it moves in power to two. So if I added another track, that would give me 32 combinations. If I had another track, it would be 64, So I've got to add more stuff. I've got to add digital counters. Well, PLCs like to do what? They like to count. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, what was happening was the counters in the original PLCs was done by, by software, by programs. And a lot of times the programs couldn't keep up with the count. So just about all your PLCs now have what they call a high-speed counter, which is actually a, a hard wire. It's actually a true counter. That's on your PLC. These guys will scream, and they'll be able to handle these encoders. Uh, so this is an animated GIF, and it should give you a pretty good idea. Of how these things work. But this is on the program. So this would be the absolute encoder. And you can actually see sensors actually lining up on this code. See that? And then it just starts doing more. It just starts counting signs. This right here is sending out a series of pulses that have to be counted. So the advantage of an absolute encoder is that it, it tells you where it's at. The incremental encoder, if I turn power off and lost power to my counters, then what would happen? I lose my count. Right? Unless I did something and saved it. So we, what we do on our robots is they have a set of batteries on them. Uh, inside the robot, but you got and it, and it uses incremental encoders because what's nice about incremental encoders is they're not limited to a range. This thing here goes past 360, it's no big deal. The counters are still going to do what? They're still going to count, right? Does that make sense? And as long as my I don't exceed the range of my counters, then these guys are great unless I lose power to my counters. If I lose power to my electronic counters, then what would happen? Yeah, we'd lose everything. Uh, so when our robot, uh, robots, when we give, uh, when we, when we record moves, it's relative to any time you give directions, even when you give directions, it's relative to a point of origin, right? You understand? So if I just said, you know, go down here to the fifth red light, turn right, 
I'm telling you directions on how to get to a certain place in Tuscaloosa, and I'm just throwing that information out, right? So you get up here and you go down here three red lights and turn right, you might be in a place you might not want to be at. So anytime you give directions, you're going to have to give it from a what? From, from an origin. So the robot has what we call an origin point. And the only problem if you lose, if you lose power to those encoders, you lose the robot origin. And then when the program runs, it don't know where it's at, right? You understand? It's lost its origin. So, uh, most places that work with robots, that's part of their preventive maintenance to go out there and change those batteries out uh, at least once a year. Some of them do more often. What we do is we leave our robots on all the time. If the batteries go dead, we, we replace them. We don't use the origin. You, you only lose your origin if you lose power to the robot. Are we okay? So y'all know the difference between incremental encoders and, dip, and uh, absolute encoders. Just about all robots use incremental encoders. We had, uh, we lost the origin on that robot. When I had my accident, I was out for a, a year and a half. And these things just sat over here a lot. They moved the Festo line. It used to be over in the Millsout building. Well, they moved the Festo line from the mill south building over here. Guess what they didn't do? They didn't plug it up. <laughs> and our Fanuc robot over there, the batteries went dead in there. Uh, the problem with with the with the uh, with the Mitsubishi robot is they did not use the factory origin. They used their own. Origin. So it's up to the company what origin they establish. So your company might have this origin, right? You understand? But once you said that, once you say that's the origin, then from then on, all your moves are recorded according to that origin. So we, we, uh, me and Nancy got over here and we went through the origin procedure on the Mitsubishi robot and it missed everything. I mean, it missed everything. And why? It wasn't the right origin. So we called Festo and he said, Oh no, he says, you gotta have a calibration plate that you put on that thing. And they sent us the plate and we calibrated it worked fine after that. Uh, the, the big fan, the Fanuc welder they have up in the well shop, uh, it runs off 440 and they needed the plug, so what did they do with the robot? They unplugged it. And guess what they lost? They, it was unplugged for a long time, but they lost the water. George. And, uh, we went up there and calibrated that according to the diet and it missed the spots too because Lincoln used their own water. Their own origin. Once he called Lincoln and he told us what was going on with him. So that's the biggest problem with incremental encoders is that if you lose power to your counters, you are. You lose counter. Limit switches. These are contact sensors. You look at limit switches over there. Are you okay there? Yes? No? So these are actual mechanical devices. We run them to all over the place, even in modern systems. They're very cheap compared to electronic sensors, they do a really good job. Uh, photoelectric sensors, magnetic sensors, and those are capacity multiplies. We'll look at those. Okay, guys, y'all go ahead and take another break. Two minutes.
guess we'll tell her the line apart on the computer stand. Uh, these are our limit forces. One vertical run is still going on our line. So this is the probably popular one for our uh, audience screen. Uh, we have plunge of limit forces. We have run of limit forces. Plunge of limit forces. We have this one for vertical run of limit forces. We operate in three. Some of them actuate in both directions. Some of them only actuate in one direction. Now, what would you think the biggest problem we have with these guys? Huh? Stick in and people that adjust them wrong, right? Uh, they'll put them in there, get them too close, and knock the operator, break the operator off, or they get it too far away. And they're electromechanical devices, which means what? Two ways to fail. They can fail electrically and they can fail water mechanically. But for what they do, uh, they are the probably the least expensive, the most cost effective that you'll run into. They're a lot, lot cheaper than uh, solid state centrifuges. So you are going to run into a ton of these guys. Uh, these are what they call electronic duties. These are the small ones. These are the ones that will run into on our manufacturing. Both lines have, both lines have. So uh, all your carriages over on the uh, the carriages, the one that moves back and forth, those have limit switches on them. And over on the uh, the Festo line, the uh, the pick and place robot, that little rotary robot right at first, it uses limit switch for its positions. And, and the Dremel, when the Dremel comes down, that uses limit switches. But they're all pilot duty or electronic duty. Me small, yeah. So usually, what we do is, if I'm if my limit switch is going to run a load, then we're going to use a pilot, pilot duty or a heavy duty limit switch. If my limit switch is going to input into a PLC, we probably use a little limit, one of these little guys because they're not handling, they're not running a load. They're just putting a, either a, a true or a false into my PLC, so we don't have to have big relays, uh, big limit switches for that. You'll run into a lot of these, and why? Yeah, cheap. They're really cheap. They do a really good job for what they do, right? You understand? And you'll run into these. And all they do, these are these guys only sense proximity, even though we don't call them. We don't use them in a category. We call them limit switches. They have their own. They have their own mouth, even though what they sense is proximity. So, guys, let's go over there and find the limit switches. On both lines. True or a false. You know, how much current does your uh, voltage source have to have to help you do? So yours are non contact sensors. Available that, that sense magnetic field. The uh, first one we'll look at is what we call a magnetic reed switch. Oh, that one's still running in the background. Uh, let's go over here. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Now we'll probably have to wait the next class so I can show you the Hall effect because I don't have a power a power supply over here, but we'll show y'all basically how Hall effects work. So a Hall effect sensor, these sensors the strength of a magnetic field when we dig for when we analog. So we have both of them. I have it hooked up up here on the breadboard. Well, that's these little guys uh, right here. You can't even see them. But these are hollow effects. So we can have digital, which means when it sees a certain strength field, it'll trip them, right? You understand? Or we can have an analog, which actually does work. Measures the strength of the field for us. And we'll look at both of them. Pros, these are solid state. They have no moving parts. Cons is what? Yeah. Both, and they drop a voltage. Solid state divides devices. A switch, if, if that switch is good, when you close a switch, it's not going to drop any boat. Solid states will, solid state devices cannot do that because they are not switches. They simulate switches, but they are not switches. So those contacts, those simulated contacts, even though they're solid state, they will drop a boat, even though it's usually less than one boat. Unless it's a certain type, we, we look at a, we'll look at a capacitive and inductive sensors. And capacitive and inductive sensors are two wire sensors. So they drop more voltage so they can generate enough power, but they'll drop a couple of volts. So, but a Hall effect usually drops probably less than a boat. So Hall effects, y'all trying to write that down? Y'all know these are up on the line, right? Are you okay? Everybody okay? So Hall effects, don't sense metals, but we can make them appear to sense metals. Uh, what we do is we would put a magnet in front or behind the Hall effect, and then when the metal comes through, it would cause the magnetic field to concentrate through the Hall effect sensor. So we use we use Hall effect sensors, special Hall effect sensors, even to sense metals. But Hall effect sensors don't require at least three wires. Three wires. So we share a comm. So they don't kill it down here. So we share a comm. So this negative and this negative is So we have a positive negative and we have a three wire. So these devices are going to be three leads. If you see the device themselves, they're going to have three leads on. If you see the sensor, they're going to have at least three leads on. Uh, they might have four. It uh, depends on the contacts they provide. And we'll look at that later on. Well, the minimum you're going to see on a Hall effect sensor is three conductors. Minimum. Uh, the maximum you'll see is four. Anybody know why? Huh? That'd be nice. Uh, they're, they're actually solid state, but uh, if we looked at one, if they showed us, and I'm going to draw it with a switch. 
So this would be a three wire sensor right here. Uh, of course, we got to power it up, right? You understand? But sometimes our sensors give us this. So we have a normally we have what we call a normally closed and a normally open. Uh, these are four these are four wire sensors. So if they got four wire sensors, they provide a normally closed and a normally open. A three wire sensor usually either going to be solid normally closed or solid normally open. And we'll look at the color code for those. So these solid state sensors are usually going to be what? Two, I'm sorry, three or what? Four. Oh, no, elect, uh, so, uh, now what, when we look at the diagram, so I'll show you all that real quick and this will be what we'll finish up today. So we'll look at the amateur line just a little bit. And I'll give you all a, a, a the next lecture we're going to do is on symbols. So we'll, uh, look at the different symbols. Oh, I didn't want that class. So these are also available on Blackboard under reference material, I think. Uh, but these are the diagrams on our lines. And of course, right now we're going to look at electrical diagrams. I think they call it O. The network's really slow today. Nope, that's not what I want. I gotta wait again. This, this this input in. So what this does is this shows us the wiring of the actual PLCs. Now inside inside PLCs, inside a PLC ladder diagram, we have very few symbols. But when you connect to the PLC, you're supposed to use the symbols of the electrical trade, not the PLC trade, the electrical. So one of the things we'll have to learn is we'll have to learn these symbols. So these are our sensors. And on PLCs, anytime you see a square like this, it means it's solid state or, or non-contact. And you see this little old trough right here? Uh, that indicates it's magnetic. It's a magnetic sensor. Well, when I look at this magnetic sensor, they call it 2B2. Notice it's only got two wires going through. So what kind would you think that would be? That's a magnet, that's a reed, right? And I look at this magnetic fence sensor, it's got three wires going through it. So this is going to be a hall effect. And that's the way you can basically tell without looking up the part numbers. So the hall effect requires power. So here's power. Right here's our power. This would be plus. This would be minus. Right here is our uh, these are sorting sensors. I'm about to find out what that means. Right now. A DC sensor is either going to be what we call a sinking sensor or a sourcing sensor. So that's something else that we'll have to learn about that. Because if you got a sourcing sensor, then your PLC has got to be a sinking input. All right? Does that make, it don't make, it don't make sense? We'll talk about that later. On. So if, you're, if your PLC had a source and input and you hooked up a source and sensor to it, your sensor wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. So if we got a sourcing, it depends on your PLC or how you hook them up. Most of your PLCs are fixed uh, the, uh, with that. Siemens, their inputs are usually sinking. So all our systems have to be sourced. Make sense? So, uh, 
that's why I wanted to show you how we could tell the difference. So if you see the square, what does that mean? Solid state sensor. Huh? Right here, it's hard to see. Let me blow it up. This, this is not exact. Most of these are most of these are drawn solid. Uh, but see this guy right here, this this uh, trough shape right there, that indicates it's a magnetic sensor. So every sensor is going to have a little symbol down there that tells us what type of sensor it is. It don't tell us how they operate, and we really don't care how they operate. All we want to know is what they sense. Because if they don't sense what they're supposed to sense, then odds are, then we would try to figure out why, right? You understand? No, it's a bed, it's a trough. <laughs> It's that for some reason uh, Amatrol didn't cover one side in, and why they, I don't know. Normally, when you see this, this trough shape is going to be completely black. But it's going to be in this shape like this, right? Understand? Can you see it now? So this side is black. I could blow it up a little more. So see? So this indicates it's what? Magnetic. This indicates that it's normally open because the switch is open. So that means when this thing senses the magnetic field, this that, that's going to close. Uh, one is your uh, plus, right? Four is your minus, and three is your output. Now what happened to two? Well, that would be a four-wire sensor. So these are three-wire sensors. So one and, one and four are your power, right? Understand that. Three would be your output. We can, we, I mean, your signal. We could look at all these sensors and they would be the same thing. Also, yeah, it's not going to a power source. So since it's not going to a power source, these are read switches. Read switches don't have to be powered. Right? Hall effects do. Understand that? Read switches don't have to be powered. So these are read switches. But notice they still use what for power? One, and they still use what? Three for signals, which is basically on industry standard. Are we okay? Questions? So I just wanted to see, show y'all how we could tell, tell the difference on these symbols, and it's important to understand the symbols, so I'll give you all a list of symbols and there'll be symbols on the test because when you hook up, when the diagram for the connection to the POC is done according to electrical symbols. The diagram inside the POC is done with POC symbols, right? You understand. And inputs, inputs, everything on the POC is represented with two lines like this and then a, normally close is a, when a line cross. They don't care how it gets into it. So when you draw the connection to the PLC, you're supposed to draw the uh, the symbol for the electrical device, not the PLC device. So we'll, one of the things we're going to look at is when we get through with this basic field of, of sensors, then we'll be able to move on and start doing other labs. So what we'll do at uh, uh, the start of next class is we'll go ahead and do, because uh, we got to have the line back together. Y'all see how often they show this. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to split that line all apart, take, take all modules apart, and then we're going to do what? We're going to put it back together and see if we get aligned right and everything like that. That's what we'll do next class. And we'll continue on with this. But uh, once we get through with sensors, basically we could start dealing with things and a little introduction into, into pneumatics, and we could start moving on and doing other things on our line. But y'all can take it apart and put it, hopefully I'll take it apart. <laughs> yeah, we got, we, we got up there at, uh, in, in our schools and those guys started breaking those lines and all that kind of stuff. And I was thinking, man, I can just imagine turning this, you know, this $250,000 piece of equipment over to these students that, that push disconnects in and break them, right? Anyway, what we do it. All right, guys, any questions? Uh, I want my re-switches back. And my uh, mercury switch back. Yes, put it in the 2B graded box.
Oh, they don't go like that. They go like this. Don't fix mom's own seeds. Are they what? Fixed. PLCs? Yeah. No, they're uh, they're. Uh, yeah, I got some right here. I'm nearsighted. I'm not far oh. off. <laughs> he said I couldn't. But I appreciate that too. I've done it. I've done it every once in a while. And fortunately, you lose your glass all the, all the time. I try to get in the habit at the house of putting in the same place every time. <laughs> I think the next assignment is ready. It's Friday. Yeah. Let's see where this goes. Yeah. Some of y'all have already done it. If you, uh, By the way, uh, I think there's only two people that signed up for the texting application. That's your call, but that's a neat thing to do.